Here are MLB's worst All-Star Game snubs. Lenny Dykstra was an extremely effective role player during his time with the New York Mets, and he was initially shocked after being traded to a crosstown rival in Philadelphia. But after getting used to his new environment, Dykstra blossomed into one of the best hitters on that team. His best year came in their NL pennant season in 1993. After injuries hampered his play in 1991 and 1992, Lenny Dykstra had a comeback season in 1993 where he finished second in most valuable player voting, losing out to Barry Bonds. He also won a silver slugger this year. But interestingly enough, the comeback tour wasn't enough to get him on the All-Star Game roster that year in the National League. He would make the All-Star team in back-to-back -back seasons afterward, but his 93 omission was especially egregious. Lenny Dykstra led all of Major League Baseball in plate appearances and runs scored, while leading the National League in at-bats, hits, and walks. He set career highs in all of those categories, plus home runs, runs batted in, stolen bases, doubles, and triples. But even in his best year, he couldn't sneak onto the National League roster for the All-Star Game. He'd finished the year with a 144 OPS+, plus, 44 ticks above league average, as well as 37 stolen bases to boot. He was the true five-tool player this season when the Phillies ran to the World Series against the Blue Jays, and is probably the most egregious all-star snub of the 1990s. Dykstra would be fairly consistent from the first half to the end of the season, improving his OPS plus by 4 points, his batting average by 10, and hitting 9 more home runs in the second half while stealing 14 more bases. Dykstra would make back-to-back all-star teams after this year, so next, let's talk about a guy that never saw the Midsummer Classic. Eric Chavez is one of the most memorable Oakland Athletics of all time. More so nowadays considering that the Oakland roster is often a revolving door as if new players year in and year out. But Eric Chavez spent 13 seasons in Oakland, accruing MVP votes in four seasons while racking up six gold gloves and a silver slugger. Despite this, he somehow never made an all-star team. We're going to focus mainly on his 2002 season for this segment where he won a gold glove, silver slugger, clubbed 34 home runs, and collected 109 RBIs. That home run mark was six 16th in MLB and first among all third basemen. He also slugged higher than any third baseman that year at a 513 clip. But in the end, the American League third baseman roster spots would go to Shea Hillenbrand of the Red Sox, Tony Batista of the Orioles, and Robin Ventura of the Yankees. But Eric Chavez had them all beat on the year in home runs, RBIs, slugging percentage, and OPS. Eric Chavez wasn't only cheated out of a Midsummer Classic spot this year, but pretty much every year of his prime, which is a shame. Chavez would see his OPS Plus fall in the second half, but he'd mostly maintain his impressive first half stats. He was by far the best hitter on the Oakland Athletics, but simply couldn't get the nod. And everyone else in top 20 of MVP voting that year made the All-Star team, except for Eric Chavez. Let's turn the clock forward a bit and talk about our first pitcher of the video. I think I sometimes forget about how good Dan Heron was during his 13 years in the bigs because of how many teams that he played for. His most notable years came in Arizona, where he made two all-star teams and placed top five in Cy Young voting in 2009. But he was also a Cardinal, an Athletic, a National, a Dodger, a Marlin, a Cub, and for our focus in this video, an Angel. 2011 was his first full year in Anaheim, and after struggles in 2010, he lived up to his potential during this season. His 1.02 whip was third in the American League, but also only second on his team to Jared Weaver. His 3.17 ERA was 10th in the American League, beating out AL All-Stars like Michael Pineda and Felix Hernandez, both of whom played for the Seattle Mariners. I think a large reason for Heron being overshadowed has to do with Jared Weaver, who had arguably the best season of his career in 2011. He pitched to a 2.41 ERA, racked up 18 wins, and finished second in Cy Young voting. Heron had been named an All-Star in seasons past, three years in a row to be exact, from 2007 to 2009. Still, his 2011 season holds his career best for complete games, shutouts, and marked the third time he led his respective league in strikeout to walk rate and games started. I think it's fair to assume he probably should have made the roster. He would see his numbers inflate in the second half, more specifically his ERA and walk rate, but the fact that he still finished in the top echelon of American League pitchers after the fact is all the more reason he should have made the All-Star team in the first place. Let's head over to the AL Central to talk about a certain slugger. Now, as you probably know by now, there are some bad snubs on this list, but Travis Hafner may be the worst of them all. He finished top 10 in MVP voting twice, slugged 498 over his career, had a career 134 OPS+, plus, and hit over 200 home runs, but never sniffed an all-star nod. The most egregious snub came in 2006, a year where Hafner had a 1.097 OPS, best in the American League, which translated to a 181 OPS+, plus, better than anyone in either league that year. Not to mention a casual 42 home run season bested only by Jermaine Dye in the American League. He became the second Indian ever to record 100 walks, 100 runs, and 100 RBI in the same season. He also tied Don Mattingly's single season record when he hit his sixth grand slam of the season. But the first baseman spots would be taken 
taken up by David Ortiz, Paul Cronaco, and Jim Tomey in the American League. But by season's end, Hafner had all of them beat in on-base percentage, slugging percentage, OPS, OPS+, and WRC+. They all had stellar seasons, however, and Hafner's Indians were the only team of the three to finish with a losing record, so this could be a reasoning for the snub. Still, doesn't make it fair. Hafner would stay mostly consistent in the second half, with his OPS Plus dropping by the slimmest of margins while seeing his slugging percentage improve, as he clubbed 17 second half home runs and upped his RBI total all the way to 117, one of the top numbers in the league. Next up is a hurdler from the NL West. Here's a player you might have forgotten. After an underwhelming rookie year in 2009, Matt Latos came out of the gates slow in 2010, posting a 5.47 ERA in the first month of the season. But he'd hit his stride soon after, and he would lower his ERA down to 2.45 right before the All-Star break, also leading the National League in batting average against and whip. His final ERA mark of 2.92 was 10th best in the National League, better than that of Giovanni Gallardo and Tim Lincecum, both of whom were named All-Stars that year. Matt Latos also had a string of 15 consecutive starts, logging at least 5 innings and allowing 2 or fewer fewer earned runs, which at the time was the longest streak in modern baseball history. It'd be broken a couple seasons later by Felix Hernandez, who went 17 straight outings. He'd post a 3.27 ERA in 143 starts from 2010 to 2014, but he'd play just three seasons after that and never recapture the success of his younger years. He never made the All-Star team, and is mostly remembered for his abrasive and aggressive nature more than anything he did on the mound. His sophomore season in 2010 would end up being the best season of his career, even though he would see his numbers dip in the second half, like his ERA going up to 2.92 or his whip going above 1. Still, he maintained a 3.0 FIP on the year and raised his strikeout rate in the second half. His coaches blamed fatigue from his first long season as the reason for his dip in stats, but his numbers are still plenty impressive. Let's turn back the clock one more time to talk about our final player from the 1990s in this video. Tim Salmon slashed a 385 on base percentage and 498 slugging with 299 career home runs and over 1,000 RBIs over 14 seasons, all of which he played for the Angels. In his 1995 campaign alone, he hit 34 home runs and collected 105 RBIs, winning a silver slugger in the process. But he was never selected to play in an All Star game, in 95 or any other year. Tim Salmon is often referenced as a player who should have been on the All Star roster at some point in his career but never got that nod. In that 1995 season, Salmon had a higher bat batting average, on-base percentage, and OPS than any other American League outfielder, with his slugging and weighted runs created plus being bested only by All-Star Game starter Albert Bell. You could easily argue that Salmon deserved a spot in 95 or any of his mid-90s years, really. He homered 30 times every season from 95 to 97, posting an OPS plus of at least 125 every year from 1993 to 1998. But no one seems to remember or care since the Angels have a new stud outfielder with a fish-based name. Go figure. Unlike most of the players on this list, Tim Salmon would improve his impressive numbers from the first half and the second half, raising his OPS plus by 12%, ballooning his batting average all the way up to 330, and watching his slugging nearly soar over 600. He finished the year with 34 home runs and 105 RBIs, with 19 home runs coming in the second half. Last up on our list is one of the only active players here today, one that I'm sure all of you are familiar with. Last up on our list is one of the worst ones here, and it's Joey Votto in 2015. After playing in at least 110 games from 2008 to 2013, Votto dealt with an injury-riddled season in 2014 and missed more than half the games played. His future was uncertain, but he had already racked up four All-Star nods, a gold glove, and a Most Valuable Player award. But entering 2015, it became clear quickly that Votto had plenty left in the tank. Joey Votto had a really impressive first half, but his numbers definitely got inflated with his second half splits. He posted an insane 1.152 OPS in the second half, good for a 216 OPS plus, making him 116% better than the league average hitter. This came alongside a 362 batting average and a 535 OBP, meaning he was getting on base more than half of his at-bats. Actually ridiculous. Paul Goldschmidt of the Diamondbacks definitely earned the start in the NL, but as for the first baseman reserves in Anthony Rizzo and Adrian Gonzalez, Joey Votto would have them beat in batting average on base percentage percentage, slugging percentage, OPS, and weighted runs created plus by season's end. The worst part? The 2015 All-Star Game was in Cincinnati, and not only did Joey Votto not get the nod, but Johnny Cueto lost the final vote and got snubbed as well. Absolutely brutal for Reds fans everywhere. As I alluded to before, Joey Votto had a monster second half, raising his batting average by 40 points, his on-base percentage by over 60 points, he clubbed 14 home runs in the second half, and added his RBI total all the way up to 80, but perhaps the most impressive is his 174 OPS+, plus, with a second half OPS plus above 200. Joey Votto must have gotten angry at his snub and taken that in stride, but that'll do it for me in this video. I'm the Jolly Olive, and I'll see you guys next time.